USS Missouri, mightiest battleship of them all, plows her majestic way through hostile waters. Close at hand always is a protective screen of destroyers, a seagoing and warlike family. The report comes in to the mother ship, man overboard, and from the Missouri's deck, the rescuing helicopter takes off. The youngest member of the Missouri's family sets off to prove its worth. Not long ago, a rescue of this sort might have tied up three or four destroyers circling for hours, eating up precious time and fuel and a prey to enemy aircraft. Now the helicopter easily spots the man, hovers as the sling is lowered and he is hauled in. In almost as little time as it takes to tell, the sailor is in safe hands. Instead of being dropped on his own destroyer, he is taken to the deck of the Missouri where medical care is waiting. The sailor will be back to full duty in a day. And as for the helicopter, she has earned her place in the family that travels with the fleet. Somewhere in Korea, offshore is the 7th Fleet. On land are observers directing naval and air operations, and the call has come in that the Admiral wants a conference. The versatile helicopter pulls the shore officers in, leapfrogs them over the choppy water, and lands them gently in the Admiral's barge. The whole matter is accomplished so easily it looks like child's play, and it has saved so much time that within minutes of the end of the conference, the shore-based officers will be back at their stations, ready to go with new instructions. Hours have been saved in a situation where mere minutes are important. That's the helicopter, ungainly, flying at an angle, shaped like a what's The spinning blades keep it aloft and in motion. It can move in any direction or stay suspended in the air. From the look of it, you'd hardly think it could fly, but it can fly all right. The Army and Navy know it. The Marines have big plans for it. The Air Force depends on it. And as for the Coast Guard, they pioneered the helicopter hoist. This is the age of speed, but it is also an age of contradictions. Perhaps then it is not surprising that the most spectacular progress since World War II has been made by a flying machine which can fly slower than any other, so slow that it can stand stock still in air. It can go up, down, sideways, or nowhere at all. It can get close to the ground for a look and stay a while to catch every detail. Here, Lieutenant General Lemuel C. Shepard, boss of the U.S. Marines in the Pacific, lands at the front in Korea. The top officers on our side have discovered that the helicopter gives them a mobility they never had before. And it has become a part of just about every major strategic decision since the Red Invasion of Korea in the summer of 1950. And as General Shepard is landing, a squad of his Marines has been cut off on a mountaintop. The enemy is all around and they need supplies. Who goes? Why, the helicopter goes. The helicopter goes everywhere. There they are, Marines on a hilltop, far from their own lines. They need food and bullets. This supply job is an easy one for the helicopter. And as military leaders find more and more uses for the helicopter, its fame spreads among the ranks, and they develop a real affection for the airborne improviser. Among the many jobs the helicopter has been doing in Korea, clearing mines, spotting troops, patrolling, transporting, none is more dramatic or more vital than its job of saving lives. Already its record in Korea stands at almost 6,000 lives saved. Almost 6,000 lives which otherwise probably would be lost. Despite the vicious nature of the Korean fighting, our Army Medical Department has piled up a tremendous record. A smaller percentage of wounded have died than in any other war. And a great share of the credit goes to the helicopter, which can go anywhere for a wounded man and bring him back fast. The combat cameraman catches all the drama as a wounded Marine is placed in a helicopter's litter capsule by his buddies. 
The road back to the hospital ordinarily over rough ground, a long and painful trip by ambulance. And the stretcher bearers have other wounded waiting for them. But the flying ambulance of the Air Rescue Service is ready. When the Korean War started, copter pilots sometimes had to knock out side windows and rig emergency supports for the litters inside the craft. Then the capsule changed all that. The man inside is warm and comfortable and can be tilted any way that the nature of his wound requires. Many are the thrilling stories the pilots tell of running wounded back through enemy small arms fire and even past enemy fighters. But each time, the greatest thrill is the mission accomplished, the life saved. From drudgery to heroism, the helicopter has been through them all in Korea. Colonel R.C. Kite, CO of Air Rescue Service, told reporters, any future action will see a greatly expanded air rescue capability through the use of the helicopter. The fantastic idea of airplane pioneer and inventor Igor Sikorsky has come a long way. There will be helicopters for peacetime use. Some are already in operation. Its horizons at the moment are pretty well unlimited, stretching all the way from heavy freight haulage to being the family's flying flivver. The research is now proceeding on new types for new duties, but the full peacetime blossoming of the helicopter must wait for a while. In a world of tension, the demands of the military take precedence. And with each new job the armed forces find for the helicopter, the demands become greater. The lives of these men must come first. From PFCs to the top brass, every soldier has his use for the helicopter. General Hoyt Vandenberg, boss man of the U.S. Air Force, uses it in his hops around the front. No other war has seen as many Pentagon officials at the front line. And in a way, it is the helicopter that makes it possible. No land vehicle can travel through these mountains, and no aircraft can land here, none, that is, except the helicopter. Here is one more reason that a major demand of the Korean War has been, send us more helicopters. And when the end of the war seemed in sight, when the communists realized the stalemate by asking for a talk on ceasefire, the demand again was for helicopters. As the news spread like wildfire through the ranks, and many were skeptical but most were hopeful, those in charge had to make plans for transporting the negotiating teams. Once again, it is the helicopter. A larger one this time, the big 10-seater H-19, as well as the more familiar ones. The communists demanded that our negotiators travel in jeeps, but we rejected the demand. We were going by jeep of the air. The hopes of an entire world are in these helicopters as they take off for the talks at Kaesong. Yes, the hopes of an entire world aboard a flying machine that people once said couldn't fly. As the ceasefire team sets off for red territory, they are writing a new chapter in the history of a new industry. This is the helicopter, which picked up a wounded man who could live only 15 minutes without medical attention and rushed him to a hospital in 12, which has rescued men trapped behind enemy lines as the communists were closing in for the kill which has spent hours hovering above the ocean looking for submarines, which is always a welcome sight to frontline troops, not ordinarily a sentimental body of men. As the rotors spin, no one knows yet how the talks will come out, but it is fitting that the helicopter, having witnessed every heartbreaking day in Korea, should be called on at a time of hope. And as the hopes of the world are in the helicopter, the eyes of the world follow the journey over the mountains of Western Korea. Tension mounts as the old city of Kaesong, declared a neutral zone, comes into sight on the horizon. 
A big white W marks off the landing field. The business of the ceasefire conferences is set to go for a long time for what's an interminable series of talk, talk, talk. Each day, the communists meet the United Nations team and go together to a ruined old house. But history or workaday chores are all the same to the helicopter. The shuttle run between the Imjin River and Kaesong from the helicopter's viewpoint is about the same as the airline passenger run in Boston or the mail run in Los Angeles and Chicago or the crop dusting, geological surveying, gathering news, fighting forest fires or any other of its uses. Beauty, they say, is in the eye of the beholder. She's not much of a looking thing, this helicopter, but to the men in Bridgeport, Connecticut who made her, she's beautiful. And to the marine whose life she saved, to the pilot she fished from the water, to the doughboys she supplied with food and ammunition, to the lost patrol she found, to them, she's a guardian angel.